All right, good morning again, everyone, and thank you for joining us and taking the time out of your day today for our, our, for our monthly webinar series. So he, this is kind of where we are in the process. Um, you know, we've, we've covered off 12 webinars now and time's really flown. Um, all of our webinars, as a reminder, are up on our website. So if you go to betconsulting.com and um, go into our about area, you'll see um, ERP unlocked, and that's where you can access any of our uh, any of our previous webinars, as well as today's webinar will be posted up on the uh, the website upon completion of our webinar today. Um, so on our last slide, we only had webinars up until number 13 listed. Um, today we're going to talk about recall, traceability, and returns management. So we have had some, I have had some feedback some, from some of you that have been attending our webinars um, and wanted more in-depth um, discussion on trade management. So um, in um, October, we'll do trade management for sales and uh, November, we'll do trade management for purchasing. And then in December, we'll talk about global trade. Okay, so we'll talk about global trade required documents and in transit. And that's some of the topics I've gotten some feedback from from people. Um, but if you have any other feedback of topics you want to cover, we haven't sort of set up our, our webinar schedule for 2018 yet. Um, but if there's specific topics you want repeated or things you want to go into more detail for, please feel free to re reach out to me. Um, my email will be closer to the end of our presentation today. So as mentioned, we're, uh, we're on number 13. We'll be talking about recall, traceability, and returns management today. Um, so after I did this um, description up um, and when I was preparing for the, uh, for the demo, I decided that I would incorporate a couple more topics in here about uh, the lot tracking um, management and the lot information card and things like that, things that flow into the traceability discussion. Um, but what we'll talk about is uh, the tool within NAV is called item tracing. So we'll talk about that today and look at um, how we can um, trace product from uh, origin to usage or usage to origin and look at um, where something came in and where it was used and then who that product was then sold to. Um, I'm going to look at a multi-tiered bill of materials today. So I'll look at um, taking some materials and making those into a work in process and then adding some additional packaging to that work in process item, uh, creating a finished good and then selling that finished good. Okay. So we'll look at some of those uh, transactions today that I've set up, but we'll look at item tracing, um, how to process a recall, some options for how you might go about notifying customers about a recalled product, um, you know, and then we'll look at inventory uh, returns and credit adjustments in here as well. So this slide I like to show in um, at least the last um, half of our uh, webinars as we've gone through them, and it's a nice visual, um, uh, you know, it, sh it shows us visually where we kind of are in the process. And we started off kind of with items and purchasing, and then we kind of followed the inventory throughout the NAV process. We took purchasing, uh, factored into planning, moved that around, looked at you know how to set up a warehouse. We looked at production and the planning worksheet, how you can use forecasting. So all of these in our previous web uh, previous webinars, we looked at sales, um, picking, shipping um, in our last one, how to go about some some best practices in there. So of course, if any if you have any questions as you um, after you review those webinars. Uh, feel free to reach out to me and we can have a, a quick discussion. So where are we today? Okay, so I'm just going to switch it over here to my um, to my NAV system. So I am demonstrating today in NAV 2017. Okay, so that is the current release of Microsoft Dynamics NAV um, and, our, and our BC ERP uh, database. So one of the things I usually start off with is I start off with these cues because in all of my years of, of implementing NAV, I mean, I've seen some great functionality, but this is really, really nice functionality. So I like to show this um, because it doesn't involve any development. So you can basically take these BC ERP activities and set these up on your own um, with just setting using the BC ERP filter groups and the filtering technology in Dynamics NAV. So I can basically, based on the role that I'm in, I can set up all of these different tiles or queues, if you want to call them that, or stacks. You know, they've been called several things over the years. Um, and I just basically set a filter on the data behind it. And the idea for this is that if I'm a warehouse person or maybe I'm a planner or I'm a salesperson or I'm in finance, um, when I log into my role, I see some tiles here that are very important to me, things that I need to address. Maybe there's some late shipments. Maybe there's some um, some uh, lots that are expired. Maybe I'm a manufacturer. I need to want to look at my lots that are expiring within the next 30 days to you know, start planning my production around that to make sure that I use some of those products before I have to, um, have to uh, dispose of them. 
Also, some contracts expiring in 60 days. So I've set these up and this list has kind of grown as we've gone through these different webinars. Um, but for today's, one of the things we're going to talk about is the lot information card. So I did set up one here and I have this basically showing me a list of lots where the vendor lot number is blank. So if I close out my advanced filter here, what this is basically doing, that tile is basically looking into the lot information card and setting some filters. So the filters that I've specified here is that the vendor lot number is blank and that the received quantity doesn't equal zero. So making sure that these are lots that I've received that nobody put a vendor lot number in. So if part of my process is that I'm supposed to record, I'm assigning my own internal lot number and I want to make sure that I assign a vendor lot number to that as well so I can do proper recall and traceability, I, w I would, this queue would be handy for me to make sure that, you know, these lots get attended to and somebody actually records that. Um, for some of you, it might be, um, it might be some other uh, fields on the lot card we'll look at shortly. And just to give you a quick overview of the queues, you know, if I look at my queue definitions here, you'll see these are my queues. So you'll see um, I'm in the BCERP role center, okay? And these are all of my queues that I've set up here. I basically say what the queue ID is, where I want it to fall within the list. Um, and then I specify what the name of it is. And then I link it to a filter group, okay? And that filter group is essentially, I'm saying go into the lot information card table and set these filters. It's as simple as that. Okay, so all of you are familiar with setting filters on multiple fields at the same time. This is essentially just doing that, assigning a code to it, and then you're letting me use that throughout the system. So very nice functionality um, that we've added into the BCERP product for these filter groups. So let's let's jump into an item. So let's start at the beginning with the lot tracking card. So how, how lots are set up and you know how we determine whether something is lot tracked or not. So for most of you on our call in the food industry, anything that basically um, is a ingredient that goes into a product um, or is a raw material or it's a packaging that actually touches the physical product generally needs to be lot tracked for most certifications. Okay, And that just makes sure that even if it's a plastic film or it's a tray or it's a tub or something like that, that can actually still contaminate a product that somebody could eat. Um, so I had, an ex um, I had a customer a few years ago that um, they had a recall on one of their uh, plastic trays because the company that was making the plastic trays for them, the machine was actually breaking down and it was actually, it was actually giving off met, hot metal filings at, in part of the manufacturing process, which were then in being embedded into the plastic and could actually come out into the food and somebody could eat them. So it is important to make sure that um, as much as possible, you're tracking everything that is actually touching food, uh, food surface uh, contact products. And how we do that on the item card is we actually link the item to a lot, uh, an item tracking code telling the system that it is lot tracked. I'll drill into that field in one second. Um, I can also here is assign what the lot numbers are. So I can have a different lot numbering series for a raw material versus a finished good versus a work in process if I want to identify that way. Um, and then I can specify whether when I want that lot number assigned at purchase receiving, you know, at warehouse and output journals, et cetera. And for those of you that are using expiration dates, I can form an expiration date calculation here, which would actually calculate from the date of receipt out and, and basically give me um, an expiration date into all the ledgers, which I, then I can use to age my product. I can also indicate if I want something to go on automatic hold when I receive it. So if I want this to go on automatic QA hold until QA has a chance to actually do their checks on it and release the product for usage, then I can actually have this automatically go on hold the QA would actually produce it, would uh, record a quality audit, and then, and then if it passes, would release the product that would be available for com consumption or sale or something like that. Okay. The nice thing about the holds in BCRP is I can put something on hold, and then I can still allow the warehouse to actually put it away or move it, move it with down the, around the warehouse as they're shuffling things around, but leave it on hold. So I can basically say that I can move it around, but I can't sell it or consume it. Okay. So I can, I can do some of those things as part of the hold reason. So drilling into this item tracking code here, okay, I'm just gonna go right into edit. And based on the item tracking code, you know, you generally may have one in your system that we've set up for you as part of the implementation pr uh, uh, process called lot all. So this is where I determined that the lot is required on all of these different document types, okay, for transfers, for inbound, lot tracking, that sort of thing. So I check all of these things off. Just be careful to make sure that this warehouse tracking is actually turned on. If that's not turned on, it's not going to track the lot through to the warehouse entries, which is which is very useful as well. So just make sure that's checked. 
But I can also down here um, on the miscellaneous tab, I can actually sp specify whether an expiration date is required always and whether, um, whether the user has to enter an expiration date. Um, in the food industry, we don't normally deal with warranties. That's more for like computer equipment and things like that. But there are a lot of companies that use NAV that aren't food related. So those fields are here um, and aren't busy ERP specific. Um, I can also specify country of origin code here as well. Okay, so at the lot level, based on that field that I'm setting up against the item, I'm telling the system what transactions are mandatory from a lot tracking perspective. Okay, so let's jump over to a lot information card for a second here. Okay, so if I do my lot and number information, um, and let's just go to a lot number that I actually uh, was playing around with a couple of days ago here. So I have my, my the lot number with an item number, the, the description, um, the date and time it's created. I can actually uh, note which the vendor lot number is. If there's more than one, I can note those in here and those will go into the vendor number list. For those of you who deal with meat, you can deal with establishment num numbers, which is essentially the plant number that the product was placed at. Because there's ever re a recall on the product, oftentimes you want to trace the source of that, that um, contamination back to the plant. So it might not necessarily be the one product that you purchased from that plant, but you may actually want to look at you know, evaluating all of the products that actually came from that plant. So establishment number comes in handy there. Um, and then I have some external lot numbers, um, my hold uh, information here. So as you can see up here, I can add, under my actions, I can actually you know, create a hold. So I can put that lot on hold directly from here. And that basically puts the whole lot number on hold based on the reason code that I'm actually specifying. And then in the background behind that reason code, as we've seen in previous webinars, I can specify whether what transactions are allowed while that lot number is on hold. So also on the lot tracking card, I can see what's been received, um, what's on inventory, et cetera. Um, I can actually list for those of you who are growers, okay, I can list through the growers, the ranch, the block, the field, the field ID, and then also some um, metrics as far as what um, variety and sub variety this item is. Okay. So you can see by this lot number field here and, and, and when we were just back on the item card actually identifying what the number series is for the lot number, it's really important to make sure that the lot number is unique. Okay. So you, each time you actually receive something, it gets a brand new lot number that is unique and is alphanumeric. Okay. And you've probably all heard us and probably many of you have heard me harp on the, um, the number series concept in NAV and making sure that your number series are all unique. So you don't want to have three or four number series, which are just a se sequential number. Always try to make sure that those are alphanumeric because that helps you in your navigate feature. It helps you, helps you on your tracing, which we'll see in a minute, is making sure that is not just a number because you could have a purchase order that is just a number. You could have a lot number that's just a number and all of a sudden your numbers get combined together and you basically have a purchase order and a lot number that have the same maybe six digit number, for instance. So always make sure that your number series are alphanumeric and that's the reason why we do that. Okay. So that, that lot card is very powerful. Um, you know, you, like I mentioned, you can do your, uh, you can put things on hold. You can look at your lot details. And also um, you can actually look at under your actions here, you can do your change log. So you can actually ch turn on the change log to track cha um, uh, who's made in, uh, edits to this lot number, okay? Who changed certain specific, um, uh, you know, fields on the lot card, for instance, okay? The change log is, is pervasive throughout the whole system. So um, I won't get too much into it now, but if you have any questions about the change log and turning on the change log, please reach out. It's very useful in tracking you know, uh, a specific uh, field maybe on the vendor card to see who changed it, when they changed it, what the old value was, what the new value was, um, and you can turn on the change log for items, customers, vendors, sales orders, etc. Okay, so if you want more information on that, please reach out because there are some some recommendations that I would make on how you actually set this up. So, um, but I have set this up here, and I can I can tell that you can see here that the old value here was this uh, vendor lot number, and I changed it to a dash two. Okay, so it does track the date and time that was actually changed and what the values are. Also, you'll see our document basket here. Um, so once I've received this lot number, if I've gotten a certificate of analysis or I've gotten a packing slip or I've gotten something that comes along with the load, basically I can actually take this uh, uh, you know, certificate of analysis that I have here and I can just drag and drop it. Okay, it's so very simple. Now I have a document that's forever linked to that, um, to that lot card. I can just go up to my actions and open the attachment, okay? And it opens up here, there's my certificate analysis for the lot number that I brought in, okay? With all the data that actually, um, that actually goes along with it. 
and that's forever linked to the lot number, okay? So then I don't have to worry about going into a file folder somewhere on my network or digging through my email trying to find it. It's always attached to that lot number for anybody to access, okay? So your documents, as we've talked about in many other webinars, you can drag and drop as many documents here as you like, and they can be of any type. As well, you can do an email, okay? So if you, have, you want to pull the whole email over here, just have your Outlook open, grab the email, and drop it into the document basket, and then you have all of the the email there as well with all the history behind it and all of the back and forth with you and say a vendor. Okay, so really useful that document basket and you'll find that document basket again is pervasive throughout the system. Okay, so you'll see it on sales orders and purchase orders and items and things like that where you can drag and drop any of those documents right into the basket. Okay, so one more thing before we get into the trace. Okay, so I'm going to pop open the item ledger entries. And this will kind of give you um, an idea. I'm just going to filter on my date here. And this sort of gives you an, an idea based on the document number and how these things kind of link together. Okay. So what I did here is you can see that um, uh, I started off here and I, I received in some tomatoes. Okay. And then I consumed those tomatoes plus a can and, and a preservative. And then I outputted an item. So I consumed it into a bright can. And for those of you who've been in our webinars before, a bright can, think of just a diced can of tomatoes with no label on it, okay? Because it's just tomatoes and salt, and maybe that could go under a private label for Walmart. It could be Costco. It could be something else. So, you know, oftentimes in the canning industry, they'll, they'll uh, during pack, they'll pack things in bright cans and then label them to whatever customer specifications as they go through. So I have a, a bright can of tomatoes, which is a work in process item. Then I consumed this bright can along with a label and a case, and then I made a, a finished good, okay? And then I sold that finished good to two different customers, all right? Okay, and then I did another consumption against another production order there for my tomatoes so I could trace it a little bit better. But you'll see this is how in your item ledger range you have all these ins and outs, okay? And you'll see the lot the lot is tracked here along with the document number. So based on this document number here, which is PRR1, you know, 1058, You'll see all of these are tied together against that document number. So all of the consumption entries and the output are tagged and linked through that document number. And that's kind of how the item trace works along with that lot and says, okay, if I'm looking at that output, what are all the things that went into it based on that document number and that lot number, then I can basically find all of that in my ledger. Okay. So this, the item ledger entry just keeps building as you'll see. Um, but, um, but this is kind of the concept of how all of that data relates together. All right, so let's look at item tracing now, okay? So that's, the, that's basically the, uh, the crux and the backbone of how this actually works. And you'll see that the item trace, there's a couple of options here, okay? They're all the same thing, okay? And all it is is, as you've seen many times in NAV before, the item trace isn't just in, it's linked in different menu parts of the system, but it's all of the item trace, okay? So it doesn't matter which one of these I actually pick. Okay, so this is our item trace window. Up at the top in the general tab, this is where I would set any filters. So if I if a customer calls me and says I have a problem with this item and this is the lot number, or the vendor, or the sales uh, customer that I sent it to, or, you know, references that as well. So I would put as much information in here as I have. So right now, the, at for first, I'm actually just going to actually, you know, let's look at the tomatoes. Okay, the 10150 is my item number. Okay. I'm going to click my trace and just within seconds, you see how quickly that was. It's basically scrolling through all these item ledger entries and let and showing me where this item, um, all of the entries with this item. So I can see here's my purchase receipt of the item. Okay. And here is another receipt. So two different receipts of the same item. I can see what the quantity is here. Um, I can expand this out and see that, you know, this consumption actually used that item and there's another consumption of that item. Okay. So it basically, you know, traces that item out and, and I'm looking at or usage to origin here. So it's actually looking at the usage of the item down through to the, where it actually came from. All right. I can change that around to origin from usage, press trace again, and then it basically just flips everything. So I have my, my purchase receipt hit, header here down through into consumption. Okay. So one of the things I didn't mention before we start is um, you'll probably want to, when you go in here, choose your columns and just show all of the columns. There are, there are a bunch of columns here at the end that actually don't show by default. I don't know why, but before you actually run the trace, because it'll actually want you to close the window and open it again. So just before you press trace, just make sure you're showing all your columns and you only have to do that the first time. And they're really handy columns because as you can see over here to the right, um, when I'm looking at up the top here, so I have, this is a, um, 
Oops, so I was going to show that in a second. So here I have a purchase receipt header. Here's the lot number, the item number, with the item description, what location, how much I received, how much is actually left. All right, and then if I scroll across here, I can see who I purchased it from. So there's the vendor and who I purchased it from. So, okay, so I don't even have to dig into the, open the purchase order to find out who I got it from. I immediately see here who I actually got that from. If I wanna drill into the record, as you can see, right, I just click on the hyperlink and it does open the purchase receipt and shows me then this is the vendor, this is what I bought it, so I can see any further information with that document number, okay? Same thing goes with my consumption here. It opens up my purchase my production order right, that was linked by production. So immediately I can get to the document just by clicking on the hyperlink. So that was our raw tomatoes that I use. So let's actually just go up one level to my whip. Okay. So now I've, I've changed the item to my work and process item. I see here, um, here's my, I did had, I had some positive adjustments earlier on for that item with some different lot numbers. Um, then I had a release production order. Okay. So I did, a, there was a negative adjustment there linked to that. Um, I have, uh, let's just expand this out a little bit. So here's my production order for my output where I made this item. Here's my lot number and there's my um, production order where I consumed it, right? So then I'm consuming that. I consumed that into a finished good. Here's my bright consumption into my finished good, 103.20. And here's the two sales of that 103.20, right? So great, I have everything all at once. I see you know, the, the work and process item as well as the, fin the finished item and then who I sold it to. If I scroll across here, you'll see here's my two sales, there's my two shipments, here's my two customers. I sold it to more food service on Holly's Fine Foods and what I actually sold to them. So immediately at the, my fingertips, I have access to that information as far as immediately who I sold it to, and then I can actually, you know, determine what I want to do as far as a recall uh, goes. Okay, so I can actually, if I want, you know, I have all these other lots in here as well. If I want to filter on a lot number, okay, of course I can copy myself, put my lot number filter in here and trace again. Okay, let me just change this. Oh, that's a different item number. Yeah, that was my finished good, right? So my finished good is 103.20. Okay, and then I just get my two sales of that item. So then I can say of that lot number, who did I actually sell it to? So once I've narrowed down to the lot number that I want to recall or the lot numbers I want to recall, of course, this is a filter so I can put a range in here. Um, I can also look up. So once I have the item number in here, I can look up to the lot numbers and select a lot number. Okay. So I see my two sales here okay, and then I can see where those came from. That came from this release production order. Where did that come from? Well, that came from this item and then uh, there's my bright and here's my consumption, and there's my purchase. So I can go all the way back, which is really nice, from my from my sales order, here's the, where I made the item, here's where I can, where did that item come from? It came from a bright, right, can. What, what went into that bright can? So I have some tomatoes and I have uh, the can, right? And then I can actually go all the way back to my purchase receipt. Okay, where did I receive those tomatoes from? Right, so all the way down to my receipt. So scrolling across here, I can see here I received the tomatoes, um, then I have my, I consume my can, and then eventually that went out to Holly's Fine Foods. Okay, so nice, so I can blow out the tree and look at all of those different entries, all the way from my finished good, all the way down through all of my bill of materials levels to where the inception of where that product came in, whether that was a positive adjustment or whether it was a return or whether it was a receipt, et cetera. So I get all the way back to that. Okay. So up here, um, you'll see that trace is what I've been using a lot. So once I have my filter set, I press the trace, it goes out and does my calculation. Um, there's a create segment here. So if I actually want to create a segment, um, I have to be on a sales um, shipment header here. Okay, so I can, create a, uh, I can create a trace here. Sorry, I can create a segment. What that'll actually do is actually, that'll filter in through your, the Microsoft built-in um, customer uh, contact management system, if you will. It's a, basically a mini CRM built within NAV. And then I can create a segment in the system and then from there create interactions. I can use that interaction to, tra to, um, to track all of my, um, my communication with the customer, you know, that sort of thing. So I can use kind of CRM to actually do some of that. All right, what you can also do here is you can print. And from this print, what I can actually do here is I can specify what columns I want to see in my report. So I can kind of sort of build my report. So I can say as the column number one, I want to see the item number. Column number two, I want to see the description. And column number three, I want to see um, the source number, then the source name, et cetera. 
I can also specify what contact information I want to print. Okay, so the, the, the contact who I need to re reach out to on those customers or items. So I can actually preview that or within, you know, these uh, later versions of NAV, um, I can actually print everything directly to a PDF, Word, or a Microsoft Excel. So I'm just going to print Excel. Um, it's going to pop open that information for me. Right. And then I get all of my trace results in here. So then I can take take my Excel document and I can, you know, make my columns larger and I can see all of my data in here, um, who I sold it to, who the customer is, and then who the contact is that needs to actually be contacted for that. Then I can use that data as my call out sheet. I can call my customers directly if I want to. Or once I have this information here, if I want to pull out the address information, I can use that in kind of a mail merge to send out a recall letter. For the most part, now people actually want to send out an email or they want to send out or they want to call them directly because recalls are very time sensitive. You don't want to send something in the mail, say, by the way, if you still have any of this product left, please, you know, destroy it. You'll want to actually, you know, uh, reach out to those customers directly um, and let them know what the lot number is, what the shipment was, what the date was, you know, that sort of thing. Find out if they have any more product left and then um, advise them on how they can actually return it or dispose of it. All right. So the key here is really making sure you have the data. Um, what you decide to do with that data in terms of your internal process for a recall is really up to you. It's making sure that we have the data here in front of you um, to actually do that. Okay. So I have some options here. Um, I can I can go through different trace results. So as, as I'm running this, okay, I can go back into my previous tr trace results. Okay, as you can see, there's my item. What did I do before that? Okay, then I searched on this item. So it does store in my in, in its memory like um, all of my trace uh, trace uh, results. So if I if I got to this point through starting off with the raw material and then I found the lot number, then I found the production order, etc. I can basically go back through my test results, you know, and with these with these radio buttons, just scroll back and th forth through all of the trace results that I did in the past because it does hold this in a buffer. Okay. All right, so if I go into, um, let's just go forward to my um, my last trace result that I had here. I do have the navigate up here on the header. So navigate's really handy. Those of you who have been using nav for years, this is, you know, this is an you know, amazing functionality uh, where I can actually uh, set navigate on this sales shipment and I can see all of the transactions that happen with that. So these are all of my register. Uh, I can see here there's a production order that produced product underneath the sales shipment order. This is my sales invoice header, et cetera. So I can look at my production order. This is where I actually produced the item. I can look at my lot and I can get directly to my lot information record here. Okay. And I can look at my lot number. Uh, so really nice and handy. Um, it traces basically using the navigate through all of those levels down through. Okay. So I am on a sales shipment header, but you'll see it's looking at a production order and a warehouse, warehouse activity, um, that sort of thing. Right. So under the um, under your traceability and your navigate as well, you have this actions and this find by reference. Um, I just discovered this a couple of days ago. So um, this is really new for me as well. So it's really nice to as I'm going through these these demonstrations to learn things as well and then be able to share those with the group. Um, I can find this by item reference. So what I'm actually doing is like now I can filter on this lot number. OK. And this lot number shows me these are all of the transactions with this lot number. Right. So um, instead of actually digging through the item ledger entry, setting filters for that lot number, I see all of the document types that are associated with that from warehouse entries, which could be any of your movements, putaways, um, transfers, anything like that, to um, item ledger entries, which could be positive and negative adjustments. It could be consumption lines. It could be output, as you see there. So it basically takes that lot number and filters it through all of the ledgers throughout the system and shows you everywhere that lot number actually, you know, was used or interacted on or or sold, et cetera. OK, so you can get to the navigate from the uh, ribbon of the item trace window. I'm just going to scroll this down here as well. I can also just do here. I can just do navigate. Here, right? And again, it's one of those areas like the item trace. It's throughout the system everywhere. So I can just jump in here. I can scroll over to my actions and say find by item reference, and then I can just look up my lot. Okay, so just just do L, just do a different one here. Okay, I can click on find, and it shows me a different lot number there. I didn't sell this item, okay, because this was my my lot number for my work in process item, but I can still see I have a, a production order. Okay, two production orders where I used this item. 
right? And then item ledger entries, okay? There's my consumption and there's where I purchased the, tomato, the raw tomatoes, um, all of those sort of things. So this is where it's really handy, as I mentioned, to make sure your item numbers or your lot numbers and all of those kind of documents throughout the system are all set up with a very unique number series, okay? To make sure that nothing is just numeric, so it's very easy to sort and filter and use these great navigate functions within the system to scroll through ledgers and find that. Okay, so let's um, so that's our item trace window. Um, very powerful um, with the trace functionality, allowing you to set filters in the header for you know uh, lot number, item number, filter, that sort of thing. Um, you know, I can filter down my lines. Once I have this in here, then of course that I can I can filter to this value. I can set any of the filters in the columns that I actually want to see. All right, so that's very easy to do. Um, I can also set them up here. Okay, so here's my item serial number created on. So it's all the columns that are down the bottom. I can set multiple filters on. Um, and of course, showing my advanced filter will then allow me to, to filter on um, different fields at the same time. So I can filter on item description, lot number, item number, whichever, whichever way I want. Because as you start building a lot of data, um, this is a test, obviously. So all I did was take, you know, a couple of lot numbers, receive them, use them, et cetera. Um, you know, you may have many, many transactions against a lot number because if you if you receive in a whole truckload of product under the same lot number, that will get used in many different production orders and then it will get sold to many different customers. So this this window down here that fills with trace results may get pretty long. You may want to actually narrow this down with filtering. Um, so just show your advanced filter and then set, say, you know, I want to filter on one specific location or a lot number or a date range or something like that. Okay. So if that advanced filter isn't showing, okay, just click on that small little down arrow beside the item trace and show your advanced filter. Otherwise, you can just filter on one field over here if that's all you're look, actually looking for, all right? And you'll also see here in the window of the item trace, it does tell you on um, what you're filtering on. So looking at this serial number, this lot number, a blank variant, this is the trace method and show column and show components, okay? If I wanna sew all items, you'll see probably before we didn't have a label showing, right? So when I was tracing things that didn't show the label and didn't show the case because those aren't lot tracked items. So I have item track only checked. So it's only looking at items that have a lot number and showing them in my trace results, okay? But I can actually switch, switch that to all and then I would actually see items that aren't lot tracked as well during those tracing process. And it would look at those based on the document number. So it would see which items were, were actually traced into, uh, were consumed into a production order based on that um, document number as a common thread in the item ledger entries. Okay, so that's the item trace window. Um, you know, this you'd use this for your mock recalls, actual recalls, run this as, as often as you like. Um, it's, you know, it's very handy, especially for, um, for auditors, love to see this. I'd love to see that you can trace very quickly. If they give you an item number and a lot number, you just punch that in and say, okay, here's where, uh, here's everything that went into it, here's everything that was used, and here's all the customers that it actually got sent out to, okay? And a part of a lot of audits, you have to be able to trace within, you know, within, you trace or recall within a very specific period of time. And often that time doesn't allow you to go into, you know, file cabinets and find things. So having everything in, in the system is really handy. We have the lot number, we do a trace. Okay, can you look up from the lot to the lot information card and say, yeah, I can immediately get here. Here's my COA. Okay, so I'm not digging in file folders and things like that to find the documents that came in with this load. I can immediately show the auditors, here's the COA, here's the packing slip, here's my proof of delivery, whatever documents that I tag to the lot number as part of that process. Okay, so after the trace, and I just want to kind of talk a bit about inventory returns and adjustments. Um, so I'm gonna focus really on the sales side of things. So I'm gonna focus, um, discuss a little bit on sales return orders and sales credit memos, okay? So I think I've mentioned this before in previous webinars, but you know, as a rule of thumb, um, you would use sales return orders for anything, anytime you're returning product. So anytime a customer is actually returning an item and you're gonna bring it back into inventory, you're gonna do some quality checks on it, you're gonna see whether it's reusable, repack whether you can package it again or whether it just needs to be disposed of, okay? You would use a sales return order. The process of posting a sales return order, actually, you know, you, you're, you're, it's, it's gonna show up in the, in the warehousing area, they're gonna receive against it. Um, you know, when you actually invoice, if you will, the sales return order, it does create a posted credit memo. So it's gonna credit the, uh, the, uh, the account and it's gonna bring the inventory back in, then you can basically dispose of it if you wish. If you're just doing a credit adjustment on the customer's account, 
you know, they said, oh, you know, I got a couple of broken boxes, but, you know, maybe I can still use them or the what boxes were wet or something like that. And you say, okay, we're just going to, we're going to give you, you know, $2 off a pound. Okay. So that would, then you would use a sales credit memo and that's really just going to adjust their account. It's not going to affect inventory. You're not going to bring anything back in, anything like that. So as a rule of thumb, that's how you could kind of should use those two different transactions. Sales return orders for inventory, credit memos just for dollar adjustments. Okay. If you're returning, if you actually put an item on a sales credit memo, okay, you're going to, re, you can, you can still process that through, but the warehouse is not going to see that document at all. They don't see it in get source documents. They don't see it in warehouse receipts to bring it back in. They only see return orders. Okay. And that's kind of the reasoning behind that. So when I look at sales return orders, okay, we have a couple in here and I created one for Holly's Fine Foods earlier. So this looks very much like your sales order you're all used to. Okay. So you have, you know, your customer, um, you have invoicing details. For those of you who are on older versions of NAV, you might not be familiar with some of the invoice, the layout of some of the tabs here. Um, in 2017 and 2016, Microsoft changed around like um, some of the tabs on where data, um, where fields show, okay, um, and introduced some things like showing more fields and things like that. So you, you know, the things might be in different fields, but everything is um, is pretty much still there. All right, so we do have these fact boxes off to the side. You know, okay, I can see how many, you know, I can see some sell to history with this customer, you know, how many, um, you know, outstanding return sales. If it, you know, if I'm looking at return orders, I can see they only have one return order open. Um, if I want to, if I get a follow up from the customer and the person who handled this yesterday is not here today, I want to see whether they already started the return order. So I can go in here and look for that. Um, so I have a couple of options here for bring for creating this return order. So I create the document. Okay, it gives me a return order number again, alphanumeric. Make sure it's unique. Make sure you don't have production orders that are also RMA something. Okay, keep those very unique in your number series table. Um, I can use uh, what's been around in NAV for a long time, which is the copy document feature. Okay. So the copy copy document uh, feature allows me to go out and say, okay, I want to look at a an invoice. That it for this customer, okay? And I want to actually look at, I want to bring, um, so I want to look at posted invoices, obviously, because I don't really do a lot with those. So let's look at a, a posted invoice, okay? And then I can find that customer's posted invoice that I sent them before, and I can click on it, and what, what it'll do, um, it's going to bring in all the information, okay? So it's going to bring in the header and the lines. Um, I can set the quantity to zero if I want, okay? Oh, I'm getting a little bit of error, so I can't use that one. Um, but the copy document, what that's going to do is basically it's going to create an exact duplicate of the invoice um, in here with the same lines and item numbers and quantities and pricing, and everything is going to be exactly the same as the original invoice. Um, but it also does down here on your invoice details fields, it fills in this apply to document type and number. So it automatically does the application. This is handy if you're going to return a full thing. But if the customer has already paid for this, okay, and you're, and, you know, maybe they've already paid for it, and then they realize they open up the boxes, realize some of it was bad or some of it was damaged after they paid their invoice, um, you won't be able to use this applies to, or you won't be able to apply it against that invoice because you can't over apply in that. You can only apply an invoice down to zero. So if they've already paid it, you can't apply it. So just be careful with using the copy document. Um, it'll it'll fill these fields in by default if you want to remove them just clear them okay and that means when you post this credit memo it's just going to go on account and then you can apply it to something later because they're probably going to take that credit on a future invoice if they've already paid the old one all right so you'll get an error when you try to post invoice this if there's not enough money left on this document you're applying to to cover this credit i also can get up here um, i can get these posted document lines to reverse which is a nice function and then up and here for it's filtering on this um, my customer and it's showing me what posted invoices and what posted shipments I have and I would have a whole list of these in here I've only posted one as part of my example right and then I can press OK and what it does is it brings in that line so it fills in that line number for me with the item number the location the original quantity the original price etc and it does create a couple of blank lines here, just, just giving me a reference to this is related to this invoice and related to this shipment, okay? So it just basically posts those in here. Those will post through to, there are no quantity or dollars associated with them. They're just memo fields. But it does post through the posted document, make it really handy to trace through back through that, okay? All right, and then from the return order, then I would I'd use my, um, my uh, BCERP functionality for workflow. 
and I would change that to released, okay? So I do have a setup here saying, you know, I manually have to, I have an edit step, so let's change it to edit, okay? And it's giving me, it's telling me the external document number, so I have a value, okay? So I have some checks and balances in there to make sure that specific fields are filled in, like pricing or external document number. Um, and then I'm gonna move it to released. Okay, so once I've released the order, then they can then it can go through the warehousing process. They can create a warehouse receipt, they can receive it back in, they can put it on quality hold, it can go through quality checks, it can be put back into inventory in the warehouse if appropriate or disposed of. Okay, so I just want to talk a bit about the return order process and these return orders once post pop up, uh, once posted, are then going to show up my trace as well because those are a document that's actually going to flow into the item ledger entry and I would see a return there where something was actually returned from a customer. Okay, so we have a couple of minutes left. Let me switch back over into my um, into my PowerPoint slide here. Okay, so just as a review, some of the topics we actually covered off in the webinar, uh, we looked at document linking in the item ledger entry. So I set some filters on the item ledger entry and we can kind of see how things are linked either through the lot number and the document number combination in there so that the system can tell what items were used to go into a work in process a product and then what items were used to go into a finished good. So we see all of those transactions and they're linked through that pr production order document number. We talked about some lot coding recommendations and just really number series in general, making sure that those number series alphanumeric are unique across the system. Um, some people decide they want their purchase orders to just be a number, and that's okay, as long as it's just one number series that is actually numeric, everything else is alphanumeric, okay? Uh, we talked about the lot tracking card or the, um, the you know, and code, the item tracking code and seeing how lots can be actually be tracked and, and, you know, enforcing some transactions in the system on where the lot number is tracked ins and outs, warehouse tracking, warehouse entries, etc. Then we looked at the item trace functionality, which is really the really center, the core point of any kind of recall or trace function. Um, so we looked at whether, we, you know, how we can put in a finished good number and a lot number if we wish hit on the trace and then we'll actually basically trace through all of the levels of all the way down to the bottom so we can see where I received all of my raw materials how those uh, flowed you know in through consumption into a um, work and process item and then how that work and process item was used along with maybe some packaging material to make the finished good so I see the blowout of all of that tree in that item trace function Okay, and then of course you can copy that out to Excel, you can print it out to Excel, you can save it, you know, you can um, as a mock recall in any of your documents and things like that. So once that information is presented to you, you can do with it what you wish, however you decide to do the recall. Just make sure you, before you press the trace, show all your columns because there are a lot of useful columns there that are not showing for some reason out of the box. We talked about some um, options for notifying customers, either using a, um, an interaction with a NAV, a CRM sort of thing, a mail merge to a Word document if you want to do that and send it out by email. You have all of those different po possibilities once the information is actually presented in front of you. Usually for the purposes of mock, the auditors just want to see that you can actually trace things and then basically you, know, um, you have the information there in front of you. And then, and then finally, we uh, talked about returns and adjustments, uh, which we just talked about, return orders and credit memos. Just as a rule of thumb, just keep in mind, return orders is when you're bringing inventory back and credit memos is just for a dollar value adjustment, okay? That's not to say you can't put items on a credit memo, but the warehouse is not gonna see it. So you're gonna kind of bypass the warehousing process um, and um, which, you know, if you have warehousing turned on, if they're doing receipts and putaways and bin management warehouse, you don't wanna do that. You wanna use a return order, let the warehouse to create a uh, create a warehouse receipt, pull the return order onto it, and then to go through the proper procedures of receiving something onto the dock, you know, putting it through a QA process and putting it back on a rack. Okay, so you want to make sure you do that. We touched on holds in here a little bit as well, and I've touched on holds in previous webinars as well. Um, but you know, really nice BC ERP functionality for being able to put a lot, a whole lot on hold but then determining based on the reason you put it on hold, what transactions can still be done with that inventory while it's on hold. And those are all linked to the a hold reason code. 
Okay, so just a couple more slides. This is my contact information. Um, so uh, I'm Kirk at BeckConsulting.com. Um, our sales team all get the sales email. So if you're looking at any, from any sales related information, feel free to reach out at sales at BeckConsulting.com. My, myself included, we'll get that email um, and, and we'll reach back out to you. Um, if you have any uh, questions, comments, concerns about um, how you, you know, doing Trace after you start using it, please re feel free to reach out. We'll have a quick session um, and I'll show you how that um, that works. And uh, for our next topic, um, it's pretty um, pretty lengthy here. Um, the trade management is something that's very very extensive within BCERP. Extremely useful um, for doing things like commissions, rebates, um, and then also for doing discounts. It's very specialized discounts and pricing um, at very different levels of a price uh, price buildup for an item, which we'll see in um, in, in our, our next two sessions. So we decided to break the trade management into two sides, and one on the sales side and one on the purchasing side, and how it can be used on both of those. So we're going to look at the trade management uh, module and how it relates to the sales side for commissions, uh, being able to set up commissions for uh, brokers or internal salespeople, how we can set up uh, splits maybe. Maybe we have the sales manager gets up the 4% commission, the sales manager gets you know, 80% of that and the salesperson gets 20% or a broker gets 80% and the internal salesperson gets 20%. So we'll kind of talk about some of that commission and commission splitting. We'll look at royalties and then we'll look at some uh, pricing and discounts and how you can build up the price from a base um, based on the customer um, and then you, how you can discount things as well. So of course, NAV, base NAV has pricing and discounts. It's very rudimentary. We've actually taken that, you know, and made that part of, um, it built that out in from a trade perspective and allowed you gr much greater functionality um, for those complex pricing scenarios and how you can build up and down pricing. And we'll touch on accruals here as well and how as we're going through commissions and things like that, how we can accrue those amounts. So at the end of the month, you can automatically see what your commission exposure is that you maybe you haven't paid out yet, but you, you know, you can account for that. Okay. Cause oftentimes most people don't want to pay out commissions until the customer pays. So you don't want to pay the broker, the commission, and then the customer take a bunch of discounts on the product or something like that. Um, you know, so you want to, or they don't pay their invoice or something like that. So, you, you know, we'll talk about that in kind of the setup as well. So just down here at the bottom, trade plans and trade partners, enhanced pricing and discounts, commissions, including the splitting and royalties, and then we'll look at trade statements as well, so how you pay out trade. So eventually, how do you get to that point? Have the system automatically create a purchase invoice for you. You'll run that through your regular AP process to then pay the broker, for instance, okay? So you don't have to just run a report and then manually key everything in, manually create purchase invoices. The system can automatically generate those for you. Okay, so that's the end of our uh, presentation today. I'll just go back one slide so you'll have my contact information in case you need it. Um, again, this recording will be up on the website this afternoon uh, once we just get it cleaned up and converted. Um, so if there's anybody in your organization that missed out on our webinar, please direct them to our website, beckconsulting.com, and then under the About area, you scroll down, you'll see a ERP Unlocked, and then you'll see all of the previous webinars there, and you can watch the recordings directly there. Okay. So again, thank you for joining us. I uh, hope you'll join us for trade management next time. Um, it'll be the third, uh, the third uh, Thursday in uh, October and, um, and that invitation will be going out shortly. Okay. Thank you very much and uh, have a great rest of your day.